Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar FAQ on Al Otro Lado versus Mallorca's permanent injunction eligibility for certain asylum seekers, brought to you by the American Immigration Council. Um, we are grateful that so many of you are able to join us today to discuss this important topic. My name is Maria Frosto, and I am the Senior Communications Manager at the American Immigration Council, and I will be your moderator for today. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Council, we are a nonprofit organization that believes that the U.S. immigration system should be fair, just, and welcoming. We pursue this objective through a multi-pronged um, approach that includes impact litigation, advocacy, research, transparency efforts, narrative change, and expanding access to Council for Immigrants. Um, I would like to introduce today's speaker and provide a very short overview of what, of what they'll be covering in today's webinar. So joining us today is Gianna Barotto, um, Senior Litigation Attorney at the American Immigration Council. Also, Suchita Mathur, who is a Senior Litigation Attorney at the American Immigration Council. Nila Sharvatula, uh, Managing Attorney at the Center for Gender and Refugee Studies. And Rebecca Kassler, a Senior Staff Attorney at the Southern Poverty Law Center's Immigration Justice Project. They will be discussing today the US government's metering practice the 2019 third um, country asylum ban and the Al Otro Lado and Mallorca's um, lawsuit. They're also going to be discussing the options for relief for both um, for clients both inside and outside the United States. And they'll address the frequently asked questions about the district's, district court's um, order and permanent injunction. Now, before we begin, um, I would like to review some housekeeping items. Today's webinar will be recorded and we will email that recording to everyone who registered for this webinar. Um, our audience will be mooted throughout the webinar. Uh, and if you have any questions for our speakers, please put your questions in the Q&A box on your screen. We will do our best um, to answer these questions for as many as possible at the Q&A portion of this presentation. And with that, I will hand it over to Rebecca Castle. Thank you, and we can just skip to the next slide. Um, thank you all for being here today. It really is my pleasure to be with you. Um, so I will start off with some background and procedural history on the Alotro Lado litigation. Um, next, yeah. So first of all, what are turnbacks? Um, key term to understand in this litigation. A turnback is a broad term used by the AOL, AOL Alotro Lado litigation team and advocates on the border. Uh, it refers to actions by Customs and Border Protection toward people seeking access to asylum at ports of entry um, to block or limit their access to inspection and to the subsequent referral and processing um, that occurs that allows them to continue pursuing asylum. Um, CBP has accomplished turnbacks in a variety of ways over the years, including simply outright refusing to inspect people perceived to be seeking asylum, physically pushing them back into Mexico without an inspection shortly after they've crossed the border, um, coercing their withdrawal of a claim of fear during the inspection process, um, and metering, which is the most common form of turn back, and I'll define it on the next slide in a second. Um, border advocates started observing turn backs in one form or another starting in late 2016. Since then, they spread across the border and became the norm up until Title 42 was put into place in March 2020. Um, prior to turnbacks, people seeking asylum could enter a port of entry on foot and be inspected just like any other traveler. So turnbacks introduced a totally different new border regime because people, are, people were generally not able to reliably access inspection at ports for the purpose of seeking asylum. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Metering is the most common form of turnbacks, and it's the system CBP put in place um, to limit access to ports of entry for people seeking asylum. Um, while metering, CBP officers stationed at or near the international borderline turned away asylum seekers or turn them away, generally before they're able to step foot onto U.S. soil. Sometimes the CBP officer will tell the asylum seeker that they have to wait or that there's not capacity for them to be processed. And those people instead, at least in the past before Title 42, had to put their names on wait lists maintained by third parties in Mexico, 
often shelters or Mexican government officials, and they would wait for weeks or months. Some metered asylum seekers were never ultimately permitted to enter a port of entry. Um, CBP memorialized metering as a matter of borderwide policy in two memos, which I've noted on the slide. And CBP's stated reason for metering was a lack of capacity. Um, I'll just note for the record that in October 2020, the DHS Office of Inspector General issued a report finding that CBP had um, taken various steps to limit processing of asylum seekers at ports, and that its claims, claims of lack of capacity were, at least in some cases, either false or were created by CBP's own decision to cut capacity. Next slide. So in response to turnbacks and the development of the metering policy across the border, um, advocates filed a lawsuit initially in 2017, and we amended in fall of 2018 to specifically call out the, the metering system that had developed on the border. Um, I'll note that I haven't included many case sites in my portion of the slides. Those can generally be found in the FAQ document that will be emailed after this presentation. Um, the Alotra Lado case was filed by individual asylum seekers who were turned back um, as they were in the process of trying to access ports of entry on behalf of a class of people who tried or will try to do so. And there's also an organizational plaintiff, Alo Trilado, which is a nonprofit that provides humanitarian and legal support to migrants on both sides of the US-Mexico border. Next slide. Um, the plaintiffs in Alo Trilado challenged turnbacks under a variety of legal theories. Um, including that they amount to the withholding of a mandatory duty to inspect people arriving at ports under 8 U.S.C. Section 1225 and to refer those seeking asylum for further process that would allow them to do so. We also asserted a number of other APA, INA, due process, and international law claims. And in the summer of 2019, all of those claims um, survived a motion to dismiss I'll just highlight one key um, element of that analysis because it's relevant to the discussion that follows today. Um, the district court interpreted the terms arrives and arriving as used in 8 U.S.C. sections 1225 and 1158. Under these statutes, CBP has a mandatory ministerial duty to inspect people who are arriving at ports of entry, and those people have a right to seek asylum. And the district court explained in its 2019 uh, motion to dismiss opinion that a person falls within these statutes requirements if they're in the process of arriving at a port, even if they have not physically stepped foot across the international border. Thus, for example, the district court interpreted the right to be inspected and apply for asylum as applying to people whom CBP turns away at the international line or other people who are otherwise subjected to metering. Next slide. Um, while the Alo Trilado case was pending, we can move on to the next slide. Um, thanks. Um, a, a new border policy was introduced on July 16th, 2019, which we'll refer to today as the third country transit ban. Um, through that rule, which was an interim final rule, um, the government announced a policy that would severely limit asylum eligibility for migrants crossing the southern border. Um, the IFR made ineligible for asylum any person who, quote, entered, attempted to enter, or arrived by the U.S.-Mexico border on or after July 16th, 2019, unless they first applied for humanitarian protection, um, asylum or something similar in a transit country and received a final denial of that application. Um, the ban applied to people who had traveled through a third country, so it generally would not apply to Mexican citizens. So this rule in one fell swoop made um, ineligible for asylum thousands of people who were waiting on metering wait lists across the US-Mexico border and who had already missed the 30-day deadline to apply for asylum in Mexico. This ban was the subject of considerable litigation, considerable litigation, including two facial challenges to its substantive validity. And it was preliminarily enjoined um, pursuant to those lawsuits, not the Alo Trilado uh, suit, 
between July 24th, 2019 and September 11th, 2019, on which date the Supreme Court stayed the preliminary injunction. Um, and ultimately the ban was vacated, but not until June, 2020. Next slide. So this ban was announced while the AOL lawsuit was pending. And after the Supreme Court stayed the preliminary injunction of the ban as a whole, the plaintiffs in the Alotra lawsuit sought a preliminary injunction of the ban's application specifically to people who had been metered prior to the ban's announcement on July 16, 2019. The theory um, behind the preliminary injunction motion was that metering is unlawful and the government's illegal metering before the ban went into effect led to the ban being applied to people who had actually reached the border already and were already waiting their turn to enter. On November 19th, 2019, the district court certified a subclass for purposes of this preliminary injunction motion, which we refer to as the PI class. Um, and that class is defined essentially as people who were subjected to metering prior to July 16th, 2019. The court also granted the preliminary injunction stating that the ban could not be applied to PI class members. The court reasoned that its prior analysis of the term arrive resolved this issue. It interpreted the ban on its face not to apply to people who had been metered prior to July 16th because they had quote, arrived prior to July 16th. On October 30th, 2020, the court issued an order clarifying the preliminary injunction, which stated that both DHS and EOIR are required to identify PI class members to whom they had applied the ban in the past and to take affirmative steps to reopen and reconsider their cases. This includes cases where the ban was applied in expedited removal or in 240 proceedings, and it would cover, for example, subclass members who had the ban applied to them between September 11th and November 19th, um, between the period when Supreme Court um, stayed the PI of the rule as a whole and the entry of the Alotrolado injunction, and during a later period, December through March 2020, um, when the preliminary injunction in our case was administratively stayed. Next slide. So um, this slide lays out a timeline, which I hope you can just take back and find useful um, to the extent you need to um, avail yourself of relief in the Allo Trilato uh, case. Um, I know it contains a lot of information, but I'll just note a couple other things. Um, as I previously mentioned, the preliminary injunction was subject to an administrative stay entered by the Ninth Circuit on December 20th, 2019 through March 5th, 2020. The government appealed the preliminary injunction and also appealed the October 2020 clarification order. Ultimately, both of those appeals uh, were dismissed as moot, um, but the Ninth Circuit panel did issue one um, substantive decision um, in the case site is Alo Trilato versus Wolf, 952 F3rd 999. In that order, the Ninth Circuit held that the district court statutory analysis regarding the legality of metering has considerable force and is likely correct. Um, September 2021, the district court and the Alo Trilato case granted summary judgment for the plaintiffs, um, but delayed entering an order um, of specific relief. Um, so the parties briefed the remedies and ultimately this, the district court issued remedies decisions in August, 2022. That was after the Supreme Court's decision in Aleman Gonzalez was entered. Um, so the district court kind of split the baby. Um, it um, interpreted Aleman Gonzalez as barring an injunction of turnbacks overall. However, the court converted its preliminary injunction regarding application of the transit ban into a permanent injunction. So that injunction is still in place today. Um, and there are now procedures in place by which people can take advantage of the relief ordered there. And I'll just note that the government has appealed um, that entry of permanent injunction. So currently that appeal is pending and there is no stay in place pending appeal. Um, but um, it's possible that uh, the preliminary injunction could end at some point in the future or be modified. 
And with that, I will pass it on to Gianna. Thanks, Becky. So now we'll try to put together all of that helpful information to see who is eligible for relief under the permanent injunction. Um, so first we'll look at this chart to review the eligibility requirements, and then we'll discuss the relief available to PI class members in different case postures. Um, so looking at the chart on the left side, we have the requirements that make someone eligible for relief under the permanent injunction. Um, the person needs to meet all five of those requirements. And then on the right, you'll see that meeting any of these factors means that the person is not eligible for relief. Um, so starting with the first requirement, the person is not a citizen or national of Mexico. Um, as Becky mentioned, the transit ban did not apply to Mexican nationals. And in this lawsuit, we're focused on individuals who were metered, entered, well, in the PI, we're focused on individuals who are metered, entered after the ban was in place, and were then subjected to the transit ban. So if the ban couldn't have been applied to your case, you're not eligible for relief under the permanent injunction. Um, moving on to the second requirement. So you were subject to metering before July 16th, 2019. Um, so as Becky mentioned, um, she already described what it means to have been subjected to metering, but also key here is the date. Um, so the person had to have been metered before July 16, 2019, which is the effective date of the transit ban. So basically, if you would have been able to seek asylum in the US before the ban was in effect, but for the government's metering policy, then the permanent injunction allows you to seek asylum without application of the ban to your asylum claim. Moving on to three, after being subjected to metering, you entered the US on or after July 16, 2019. Again, that's the date the transit ban was put into effect. Um, and I'll note that the AOL PI provides potential relief regardless of whether the person ultimately entered the US through a port of entry or if they e -lead. Then moving on to four, you claimed fear, sought asylum or intended to seek asylum, but you were deemed ineligible for asylum based on the 2019 third country transit ban. So the transit ban had to have been applied to the person's case, either in expedited removal or in 240 proceedings. Um, and people would have, and also this includes people who would have submitted an asylum application in court, but maybe the judge told them that they weren't eligible because of the transit ban. And so they didn't end up applying. They would also be included. And then under the last requirement, you would still like to pursue asylum in the US regardless of your current location. So we'll be discussing options for people who are both still in the US and those who have been removed from the US. Both are eligible for relief under the permanent injunction. Um, it doesn't matter their location. So moving on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so to provide a roadmap, we're going to be discussing the forms of relief available to PI class members under the permanent injunction. Um, we'll be discussing relief options for people who are both still in the US and those who have been removed. Um, and first, we'll start by discussing people who are still in the US and who received a negative CFI. Later, we'll move on to people with a final removal order from 240 proceedings. Um, so people who received a negative CFI based on the third country transit ban, these are folks that had the transit ban applied in expedited removal proceedings resulting in a negative CFI. If the person had IJ review of the negative CFI, the IJ would have upheld the negative CFI such that the person would have an expedited removal order. Um, if the IJ didn't uphold the negative CFI, the person would have continued on to 240 proceedings, so they would be in a different posture. They might still be PI class members, but they're not relevant to what we're discussing in this section. We'll get to them later. Um, let's see. So basically we're focused with people who are still in the US with an unexecuted expedited removal order for this section. Um, these are people that for whatever reason have yet to be removed. Maybe they were released from detention during COVID. Maybe they're on an order of supervision now. Um, but essentially for folks in this posture, USCIS will be scheduling them for an interview to determine whether they are a PI class member. Um, we'll discuss the interviews next, but if the officer finds during after the interview that it is more likely than not that the person is a PI class member, then they'll receive a new CFI without application of the transit ban. So that's the relief available to them under the AOL permanent injunction. 
um, we will cover folks uh, with removal orders from 240 proceedings in the next section as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so. Let's see. Okay, next slide. We already covered that. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll speak a little bit more about the class member screening interviews. Um, so USCIS is sending out interview notices in the mail um, to people who could potentially be eligible. Um, this includes a notice of potential class membership and also a non-detained form G56, which is the interview notice. Um, very important, make sure that your client has an updated address on file with USCIS. Interview notices are being sent to the last address USCIS had on file, um, and it's possible folks had their CFIs years and years ago, and so they, they've likely moved. Um, based on the data we've received from the government, there have been a lot of no-shows at the interviews, um, and we're guessing that's likely due to not receiving the interview notice, probably due to moving. Um, so if you think your client should have received an interview notice and they haven't, please feel free to get in touch with us with class counsel. Um, we'll provide contact information at the end. I'll also note that not all the interviews have been scheduled, um, but regardless, feel free to contact us if you think your client should have been eligible and, and they haven't heard yet. Um, also contact us if you think your client may have missed their screening interview. Um, maybe you know that they moved um, and you think they, they might have missed the notice um, and we may be able to help with that as well. Um, so the interviews are conducted by an asylum officer, and they're generally scheduled either at your local asylum office or at an application support center, ASC. Um, during the interview, the asylum officer will review any evidence that the person submitted regarding their PI class membership. We'll discuss suggested types of evidence um, in a bit, but the officer will also ask a series of questions to see if the person attempted to present at a port of entry before the date of the transit ban and they were metered. Um, the questions focus generally on when the person began their journey to the US, when they reached the border, what happened uh, if they approached a port of entry, what happened if they tried to put their name on a wait list in Mexico. The officer will also cross check the person's name um, to see if it appears on the metering wait list that the government has access to. And the government doesn't have access to all the wait lists. Um, and in our FAQ document, we list the wait list that they do have access to. Um, so again, if the person's name is not on the list, that doesn't mean that they're not necessarily a PI class member. Um, the government just doesn't have all that information. And again, the standard in the screening interview is whether the person shows that it's more likely than not that they're a PI class member. Okay, we can move to the next slide, please. Oh wait, actually go back, please. Go back one more. So we should be in one that says suggested evidence. Okay, we might be missing, oh, here it is. Okay, great. So suggested evidence uh, to bring to a class member screening interview or to submit before one. So documentary evidence is not required to show PI class membership, but of course it can be helpful for establishing it. Um, any evidence should be submitted at least 10 days in advance of the interview. The interview notices say seven to 10 days, but we like to err on more time just to make sure it's received. Um, and you should be able to um, send that evidence by fax, email, or mail to the asylum office um, conducting the interview. If you arrive at the interview with evidence that wasn't submitted ahead of time, the interview will most likely be rescheduled. So do try to get that evidence in at least 10 days before. So now to discuss types of suggested types of evidence for clients to submit um, to show PI class membership. Again, documentary evidence is not required though. So one key piece of evidence that your client can submit is proof that they put their name on a wait list in Mexico before July 16, 2019, the effective date of the transit ban. Um, some folks who put their names on wait lists took a photo of their name on the list, so that would be really helpful. Um, and again, the government will be cross-checking names with the wait list that they have. So if they don't have a photo, the government will be checking the list that they have access to. Um, the fact that someone's name is not on a wait list does not mean that they're not necessarily a PI class member. Again, the government doesn't have all the lists. 
some of the lists are incomplete. And we know that asylum seekers were denied access to some of the lists, so they may not have been able to actually put their name on a list. Um, other types of evidence that are helpful, um, letters from a shelter in Mexico with the date, ticket stubs from buses or transport, a hotel or other receipts from their time in Mexico, a declaration from the person, family or friends or other people that can speak to their attempt to enter the U.S. to seek asylum before July 16, 2019. So with the evidence, you know, be creative. It's similar to showing continuous presence, for example, for a cancellation case or certain types of adjustment. Try to help your client brainstorm what documents they may have or might be able to get. Um, but again, if they don't have any documents, they are not required. Um, they should just be able to show up at the interview and explain what happened. Um, so after the screening interview, if the officer finds it more likely than not that the person is a PI class member, they'll be scheduled for a new CFI without application of the ban. You can either have the new CFI immediately after the screening interview or schedule it for a different day. Of course, make sure your client is prepared um, for a CFI if your plan is to go forward immediately after the screening interview. Um, if the person passes their new CFI, they will be NTA'd and placed in 240 proceedings where they can pursue asylum or any other relief that they may be eligible for. If they receive a negative CFI, they'll have the opportunity for IJ review as with any CFI. Um, we have asked the government what happens to individuals who are not found to be class members or who fail their CFI or IJ review. They told us that decisions are made on a case-by-case -case basis based on public safety, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's unclear whether enforcement action would be taken against the person. So definitely something to talk through with your clients. But as the notices say, if the person misses the interview, um, that will be reported to ICE. So it's likely enforcement action could be taken then. So I'll briefly wrap up um, with a couple of issues that we've seen come up with screening interviews uh, based on the attorneys who have reached out to us. Interpreters, the notice says that you should contact um, the asylum office to request an interpreter if your client needs a language other than Spanish or English. Um, we've seen that some of the notices don't include contact information for the relevant asylum office. So if that's the case, feel free to reach out to us um, and let us know. Also, um, in some cases, clients have received interview notices when they're already in 240 proceedings, so they don't need a new CFI. Um, and again, in those cases, we're happy to reach out to, to DOJ um, and, and explain that the person doesn't need an interview. Um, again, if you see issues, please feel free to reach out to, to us, class counsel. So now I'll pass it over to Suchi to discuss people who have unexecuted removal orders from 240 proceedings. Thanks, Gianna. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so I'm going to address relief for PI class members with unexecuted removal orders resulting from 240 proceedings as opposed to expedited removal, which Gianna just covered. And these are folks who are still in the United States, who were denied asylum by the Immigration Court or the Board of Immigration Appeals and have a final removal order. Um, so these PI class members have to file a motion to reopen to get those old orders reopened um, and in order to have another opportunity to seek asylum without application of the transit ban, the 2019 transit ban. Um, luckily, the government has agreed to specific, oh, and next slide, sorry, I thought we were on there. Um, the government has agreed to specific template AOL motions to reopen. Uh, can we get to the next slide, please? Yes, that's perfect. Um, and all the template materials are available online, including a list of exhibits to include. Um, and you can use the, this AOL template motion if you meet the PI class membership criteria that Gianna discussed before. So really briefly, again, that's you're not a Mexican citizen, you were metered before July 16th, 2019, you entered the United States after that date, you sought asylum, but you were deemed ineligible based on the 2019 ban, and you still want to pursue asylum in the United States. Um, and it's important to note that there is no filing fee um, for AOL motions to reopen, and the motions pursuant to the injunction are exempt from the time and numerical bars that apply to normal motions to reopen. Um, additionally, if you will represent or encounter a PI class member who was ordered removed by the IJ um, or BIA under the ban and the case is still on appeal via PFR at a court of appeals, you might want to consider seeking a remand 
to supplement the record with evidence of class membership so that your client can go ahead and seek asylum without application of the 2019 ban. And next slide, please. So what should practitioners include along with the template motion to reopen? The government fortunately has issued fairly specific instructions as to this and the links to all those instructions are in our FAQs. Um, you can also put them, circulate them later if people can't find them. And there are separate templates for the Immigration Court and the Board of Immigration Appeals. As with other motions to reopen, you have to file with the last tribunal that issued a decision in your case. Um, you should, of course, personalize the template material, but the government also strongly encourages including a declaration from the impacted PI class member describing how, when, and where they were subjected to metering prior to July 16, 2019. And I think, you know, that is fairly important. That's something you certainly want to develop with your client if you have a client in this position. Um, you should also attach any evidence and other documentation of metering, such as proof of stay in Northern Mexico in that time period, travel in the region, all the things that Gianna just mentioned um, that you would want to send to the AO before your CFI, that's the same kind of evidence that you would want to include along with your motion to reopen. Um, we would also strongly recommend including any additional information about your client's general eligibility for asylum that was not previously submitted. Um, and this is because as we'll talk about in a little bit, not only the motion to reopen, but the asylum application itself can be decided on the paper. So you want to give your client the best chance to actually winning asylum or at least having um, the proceedings reopened and recalendared. Um, and lastly, there is additional guidance about what exhibits to include from class counsel. It's on AIC's website and the link to that is in the FAQs as well. Um, you do have to follow all the other normal motion to reopen procedures such as serving all papers on opposing counsel at DHS. Okay, can we get to the next slide, please? Thank you. So what actually happens after one files one of these motions to reopen? Um, if the IJ or BIA grants reopening, EOR is gonna send, um, the Executive Office of Immigration Review is gonna send a notice to the class member or their representative that the case was reopened. But they might also simultaneously or contemporaneously issue a written decision granting or denying asylum on other grounds, so grounds not related to the 2019 ban. Um, so there is a possibility, for example, that the IJ would grant reopening based on AOL class membership, but review the record of proceedings and deny asylum on a different basis. And, and that's why, as I mentioned previously, it's super important to supplement the record to any additional evidence about um, asylum eligibility that your client might have. Um, if asylum is denied, the class member would have all the normal rights to appeal to the board or file a PFR with the circuit court. Um, and also, if asylum is denied, the agency would issue a new removal order dated on the day of the decision denying asylum. So if, you know, you deem that it's necessary or appropriate, your client could file, you know, any motions to reopen or reconsider without being impacted uh, by the prior AOL motion to reopen in terms of the numerical bars. If the motion to reopen is granted, um, EOR can also do two other things, right? They can grant asylum on the papers, as I mentioned, or they can recalendar proceedings, um, in which case the PI class member is going to have to appear at future hearings. And so as Gianna already mentioned, once you file the motion to reopen, it's super important to keep the Immigration Court or Board of Immigration Appeals and DHS apprised of any address changes um, because of the possibility of having future court dates. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, I think that it's, I'll turn it over to Mila now. Thanks, Uchi. So um, this is just a roadmap for this section. We just went over the procedures for PI class members who are still in the United States. And now we're gonna go over how PI class members who are no longer in the US may be eligible to return to pursue their asylum claims. Um, so the two postures people are going to be in, similar to um, inside the United States are people who were removed after having the third country transit ban applied uh, in expedited removal during their CFI, 
their credible fear interview or removed after asylum was denied in immigration court or at the Board of Immigration Appeals based on the transit ban. So moving to the next slide, um, this graphic just shows the basic process uh, on the next slide for class members outside of the United States. Um, the big picture for our, our outreach is that individuals will fill out a survey that allows us to determine whether or not they are likely to be class members. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? There we go. Thank you. Um, so following this arrow, the first, you know, we're trying to get individuals to fill out a survey that allows us to determine whether or not they are likely to be class members and then provide support to them. Um, likely class members submit a request for a PI class member screening determination to USCIS by email, along with some evidence of class membership. And then on the next box, you can see that if um, USCIS determines a person is more likely than not to be a class member, the likely class member fills out an I-131 for a parole application. And those individuals will generally be issued a notice to appear or an NTA when they come to the border and placed in 240 proceedings. But like Jana said earlier, it's a case by case, case determination. Um, and so there may be some deviations there. So going to the next slide, this is just showing the various kinds of outreach that we are doing to find our class members um, who are no longer in the United States. So the first step is really to identify likely class members and then ask them to complete our survey. And I've tried to include links here to um, some of the, the bigger outreach pieces that we have. Um, we have collaborated with Al Otro Lado, the organization, and created some outreach materials. Um, and these are on the next slide, please. They, thank you. So we have a Facebook page that has some information and graphics. We have, um, um, AIC has a class member website. Um, Al Otro Lado has also recorded some video explainers that go over class member requirements. And all of these are available in Spanish, English, and Haitian Creole. Um, USCIS also has a class action notice up on their website, and attorneys or class members can email us. Our email address is on this slide um, if they have questions. And that can just be accessed at the USCIS website under all of their class action notices. So we will continue to broadcast our message and targeted outreach in Ecuador, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, because we understand there are larger populations that maybe have been affected. But that is not to say that there aren't um, class members who are not from those countries. Um, and so again, we have, we have some outreach materials to those class members. And we're pursuing non-digital outreach as well and uh, outreach outside of those three languages to make sure that we're being accessible to class members as best we can. So again, the goal is to have people fill out a short survey, and then if they may be class members, we follow up um, to provide more individualized support so they can request a screening from USCIS. Looking at the next slide, um, the let's talk about the screening and parole procedures. Once people have filled out the application, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the survey, and we can see that they may be class members. They need to provide biographical information, including their complete name, date of birth, and um, country of birth, and any names used in their immigration history to help immigration, um, help the government link up their information with what they have on file. Um, date of birth, country of birth, A number, if possible, G28, if applicable, and then evidence of class membership, if available. And this is similar to evidence that I think Jana and Suchi both reviewed in earlier slides. Um, the evidence of class membership or documentation of a stay in Mexico, and again, um, evidence of waitlisting. And we do want to emphasize that some people may not have that evidence of, wa of waitlisting or their stay in Mexico um, besides their own detailed statements or may not have been able to put their names on a waitlist. All of that is okay, but it just needs to be explained if possible. Um, so it's something to explore and develop with your client if you don't have some of those um, other 
harder proofs like photos of a name on a wait list or um, a letter from a shelter, ticket stubs from buses and things like that. The information um, then gets emailed to USCIS. They send the parole application um, with instructions via email. Um, and that will kick off the parole process to get that parole application approved for the person's return to the United States. So from there, I'm gonna turn it back to Gianna to talk about people who were removed and have negative CFIs. Thanks, Neela. So PI class members who are expeditiously removed, uh, next slide, please. So if they were expeditiously removed based on the transit ban, they can go through the process that Neela described. Um, and if you know of anyone who's in this posture, who's abroad now and might be able to benefit from the permanent injunction, please ask them to contact us via email, fill out the survey, and we'll get back to them and assess their eligibility. Um, if you represented the person, feel free to send us an email about them, especially if you're still in touch with them and know how you we might be able to reach them abroad. Um, so if someone was expeditiously removed and completes the USCIS screening process, and then they're found more likely than not to be a PI class member, they can submit their application for parole, like Neela mentioned, and then once the parole is approved and the person arrives in the US, um, we think they should generally be NTA'd and placed in, in, in 240 proceedings, um, so they wouldn't receive a new CFI. Um, of course, the government mentioned, as Neil said, that this, these decisions are made on a case-by-case -case basis, um, and so are decisions as to whether to detain the person on arrival. Um, so if you're an attorney helping someone going through this process, please make sure to advise your client about the risk of detention upon arrival, particularly if they have criminal issues or multiple prior entries. Um, but from our understanding, it seems like people will generally be placed in 240 proceedings um, and not detained, but it is on a case-by-case -case basis. And I will now turn it over to Suchi. Thanks, Gianna. Um, could we get to the next slide, please? Great. So the last thing I'm just going to touch on briefly is um, the situation for class members who were actually removed pursuant to 240 removal orders and thus um, as Jana just mentioned, are, are no longer in the state. So these folks um, were de removed again after the IJ or BIA didn't deny their asylum applications based on the 2019 ban. Um, so again, they must first submit an AOL motion to reopen before they can access the advanced parole procedure that Neela described. And EOR was supposed to conduct its own review of cases where the 2019 ban was applied um, in sua sponte reopen cases of class members. The data that we have from the government seems to indicate that anywhere between 200 to 300 cases were reopened um, as of 2022. Some of those were sui sponte reopenings, some of those were pursuant to motions, um, but many of those were people who hadn't actually been deported yet. Um, we're not sure how many of those decisions ultimately led to a grant or denial of asylum. We don't have that data. Um, but we do also know of a handful of individuals who were actually removed, who had their cases to a sponte reopened, at least three of whom were helping the government look for in Honduras right now. And that in one other case, at minimum, EOR reopened and granted asylum just on the papers, and the government actually is in touch with that person who's abroad. Um, but if you do have a client in this posture for whom you filed an AOL motion to reopen, um, if the motion is granted and the case is recalendered before the immigration court or, you know, remanded from the board to the IJ, the class a member is likely going to be eligible to apply for advanced parole via the procedure that Neela described. Um, and then once in the U.S., their reopened remo removal proceedings would proceed, move forward as usual. Uh, meaning that DHS could argue against asylum, um, they could receive another removal order. So it's just things that you want to talk to your um, potential or existing clients about. Um, and as Gianna mentioned, we would ask that people fill out the survey if they think they might be eligible um, to return to the U.S. via these procedures. That would be super helpful for us. Um, and I think with that, we can proceed to the questions and answers. Great, thank you ladies. So yes, we would like now to answer your questions or the questions from the audience. As a reminder, for those in the audience, you can enter your question in the Q&A box on your screen. We will do our best to answer um, as many questions as possible. 
So we do have a question already on the queue. And the question is, are the new CFIs de novo or considered in light of the prior CFI testimony? Thanks, Maria. I can cover this one. Um, so our understanding is that these are de novo, um, but of course, if there is conflicting testimony with the prior CFI, that can be taken into account um, and raise credibility issues. So something important to, to keep in mind with your clients. Again, for the audience, if you do have a question, please feel free to um, include it in the Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. We'll give some time to type these questions. Well, while we wait to see if there are, um, yes, there is another question. It says, if applicant was granted asylum in Mexico, but decided to come to the US anyways, they will no longer be eligible, correct? Um, okay, I can take the first stab at answering that. So I think the that question has a is kind of complicated answer. So if the person, first of all, you know, they still have to meet the other criteria. So they had to have been metered um, before July 16th, 2019, entered after that date. Um, if they applied and received asylum in Mexico, they're going to have a different issue, right? Um, even if they meet the other class membership requirements, they're going to have um, uh, like a potentially a firm resettlement bar to their asylum application. Um, and that the question of being granted asylum in Mexico um, is more, I think, related to the application of the 2019 transit ban, um, which is no longer in effect. And so if you're a class member, I think the issue is more um, sorry, <laughs> just lost my train of thought, is more, are you going to be deemed really resettled um, in, in Mexico? Um, does anyone else from the team have other thoughts about that question? No, I thought you covered that well, Suchi. Great. Um, great. So while we wait, I mean, to see if the audience has any other questions, oh, here we have one. <laughs> um, no, we, sorry, we do not have another one. We'll wait for more questions. Are there any um, additional comments that any of the panelists would like to share at this time um, or thoughts? I guess just to follow up um, with Anna Luisa, I would still encourage um, that person if they did have the ban applied to them, which they sh which they might have, you know, because this is kind of a complicated um, procedural history that to, to seek either reopening if they were already denied asylum in the U.S. or a new CFI, um, because there's many ways to kind of overcome the firm resettlement bar once you're in proceedings. Um, so I, I hope that in that case, um, the person would still consider kind of seeking relief under the court order in, in this litigation. Right. I can say one other thing, <laughs> sorry, since we have a few minutes. Um, in light of the new proposed asylum transit ban that under the Biden administration that, you know, we'll be seeing a final rule shortly, um, we've kind of pushed the government to uh, 
give us their position on how it interacts with the court's order in, in our case. Um, my opinion is that people who receive advanced parole under the procedures that we've discussed today who are class members and receive advanced parole should be able to enter the United States and not have the new ban applied to them. Now, you know, that's not 100%. That's just kind of my interpretation of our case interacting with the new proposed ban. Um, but in my mind, that's one of, if, if that's accurate, that's one of the bigger benefits of um, seeking relief as uh, you know, as a class member in this case, because of how complicated it's going to be to seek asylum at ports of entry once the new ban is rolled out. Um, so I don't know if others had thoughts about that, um, but that was just something at the top of my mind. Great. So I do not see any additional questions at this time. Um, oh. So I, I'm going to do some housekeeping items, including any follow-ups from this webinar. So thank you everyone who joined us today for today's webinar. Um, we hope you found the presentation informative and engaging. Um, as a reminder, a recording of this webinar will be emailed to all registrants very soon. That email will also include a um, link to the slides and any additional resources that the speakers mentioned here today. Um, we have other webinars planned in the future, so please watch out for those invitations. Also, the council relies on contributions from people like you to continue to do our work. So we hope you will continue to support the council and invite you um, to visit the council's website at AmericanImmigrationCouncil.org. Um, we also encourage you to subscribe for updates um, on our work and unpacking of uh, immigration policy and law. And please check out our extensive resources and consider making a donation. So thanks again for joining us and I hope you have a great day.